I'm Mike. I, I put loads of slides together because I wasn't sure how much Mark was uh, going to be updating. There seemed to be some interest there, which is great, and some great news that came through. Is it, um, so I'm Mike, Mike the Bee Beardmore. Uh, there's loads of Mike Beardmores around, and when I started my Twitter account, I think I needed a name that was shorter than my, my full name uh, to make me unique, so I uh, created Mike the Bee, and it seems to be successful. Uh, I always say with uh, Twitter handles and things, people need to be able to spell them, so if I say Mike the Bee with two E's, generally people get it. So I like to think of myself as a tech ninja, um, with having grown up before microprocessors, interested in computers, but being big things and didn't want to do punch cards. When microprocessors came along, it gave me a real opportunity to get involved, and I, I've enjoyed doing it both professionally and now as a maker um, and helping people and others. But this is how I think I might look, but I suspect you look at me, you think I'm like this, really. Hopefully the smile comes through, even if it isn't on my face as it is on uh, the character here. Uh, it came from a the open cliff part, and it's a great thing to see some really nice, uh, useful bits of uh, open cliff art that I could include. So, we've talked about TTN. Who actually knows something about the Things Network? So, some, okay, good. And Mark's given a bit of introduction as to what it is, so I'll be able to s slip through uh, quite quickly. But I'm very keen on what the Things Network people put in their original um, charter, really, which was to create an internet for the internet of things. So a community a developed internet that would be free and available to everybody globally. So the confusion often arises when I'm talking to people, uh, they're interchangeably using LoRa, LoRaWAN, and other tech, uh, terms. LoRa is the radio protocol. It is basically peer-to-peer, -peer, just a single channel. LoRaWAN extends that to multiple radios and multiple channels, sped spectrum and uh, parallel uh, data flows. It can be proprietary in some ways in the way that it's actually implemented, or it can be open in the way that Things Network are doing it, all encompassed under the LP-WAN. Um, so one of the great things I'm looking for, although some of the, uh, we like to say would be open, but we can't use totally open radio technology, this is a patent uh, by Semtech. Uh, but they've formed the LoRa Alliance, or were one of the first members of the LoRa Alliance, which is a group of all interested parties who have extended the protocol to allow both commercial and open implementations to be done in a secure way. Open LoRa are one of the groups that are pushing the open side of things. The Things Network are a group that got together in Amsterdam after an arts project. They were so inspired by the Arts Project connectivity option that they chose, which was based around uh, Laura Wan. And one of the guys there, who was a serial entrepreneur, said, I have some money. I'd want to really bring this out throughout the world. How do we do it? Well, we create uh, a community that rolls out and build all the models, but also support them in terms of hardware and software by crowdsourcing. And last November, so that was last July, July 2015, last November, uh, Mark Stanley was inspired to stand up a, a Reading Geek and inspired another group of people to get together, including myself, and form TTN Reading. So how do we build TTN Reading? Well, there's some really good webcasts uh, on the Things Network uh, YouTube channel about building it. Uh, and the most recent ones were from New York, New York City, and also a small town outside New York. Small, big 150,000 people, they say a little tiny place, 150,000, and how they did there. The latest one was about Sydney and uh, another town outside uh, Sydney, Australia, where a semi-commercial, a, a company that's already doing uh, radio systems, was inspired by the open nature, and they decided to uh, adopt the uh, Things Network and Laura, and they're rolling that out, and they tell us how they did it. And both of the common two things there were that they wanted to involve the communities and get the groups together. So building a network of communities to build the uh, network around the globe and roll it out. And Mark Stanley's bit about Reading was presented there, and one of the things he said about the community side, about building bridges, and used a common theme of bridges. And he started off by talking about the bridge in Reading and the bridge in Sydney and commonalities. I found this one, and it said how long the bridge took to build, and I think that's a, a good reminder of me that we can't, we think we've done well in one year, which we have indeed, 
but we're going to, we may end up slowing down before we move forward. And I think Mark's reference to the, as the profile increases, the regula regulatory uh, involvement comes in and that could slow things down and we need to keep pushing forward if we're going to be successful. The Reading Bridge, which we're going to use for a, a Reading 2016 Year of Culture illumin, illumin, or <laughs> an illuminating project, will have a TTN data feed to it and we want to use that as an example of, of an arts use case because we want to bring in a lot of the arts community who aren't very geeky and don't really see the need for incorporating radio stuff and we'd like to show them how they can move on and, and use it, especially given the uh, license-free nature of the TTN. So it was also a community bit of a project in that they had a name, uh, naming competition, and it was a, a time just before, really, the uh, famous name came along, but various suggestions were Lady Dies Bridge. Ricky Gervais, of course, coming from uh, Reading, was one of the suggestions. Swan Shredder, I think, because of all the guy lines that hold in the bridge up. And Ali Ali O, I didn't understand it, but apparently it was something to do with the end of September. So if you understand it, then explain it to me later. Um, but there were no Bridgie McBridge faces suggested. So I think it was just prior to the, uh, that uh, uh, bridge, uh, well, no, Mook Gate, I guess. So where are we? Well, we've got uh, 10 gateways around, hosted by individuals um, and companies, and the Grow incubator here at the bottom, uh, which is a Grow at Green Park under the big wind turbine, for anyone who's been along the M4 will know that. And now the job is to get uh, nodes rolled out. So we've got to build bridges, we've got to build bridges, and we've done this, Mark Stanley's been very active himself, Geeks and norms, we might say, arts and business, and we've got all these various people on board, but also the local council are very interested because they see it's an, a, a way of lowering the costs of monitoring such things as traffic management, which they currently pay a, a fee per node with. Um, so, so these are all the various places we've been currently talking to. Reading Geek Night was the start as one of the uh, evenings where various presentations are done. Sage are a company that uh, do asset management and resource tracking with their accounting packages, and so they are interested in, in technology, and they're very active. I mean, we know Sage as a small accounting, or at least I knew them as a small accounting company, but they, they're very keen, and they've got uh, really are into all of the, the technology and incorporating it into their accounting. Reading Buses are very interesting. They, they're doing, they're most, one of the most innovative bus companies in the UK, as far as I could see, and I think they've won awards on that. They've done a student bus, which is, has a chill area at the back. It has a, a game pad in it. It has a bookcase, even, interestingly. And this bus is in big demand by various schools as they, they'll say, well, we'll lend it to you, or we'll, we'll take your, uh, use it as the school bus route for a certain number of weeks. And then they have a competition as to who, because there's so many kids want to ride on this bus. And... You can find some photos if you look on the, on the Reading Buses site. Solent IoT, a, a, one, a group which is going to be uh, a bit like the Australian model, a little bit commercial and a little bit uh, public. And part of the idea is to uh, be able to leverage both sides of it and make it a sustainable. And, of course, the, the Solent area is ideal because there's a lot of marine equipment which is very expensive. So the cost of a small device isn't... Uh, so much, but you might want a number of them. So how are we going about... Uh, okay. Um, how are we going about going forward to the next stage? We set up a company called Thingitude, which is a limited by guarantee company, which Mark tells me is, is, is a very good place to be in a very a useful uh, a way. So the idea being that uh, it, it will potentially be a way of purchasing lots of things in bulk and distributing them out a marketplace for people who have uh, items to sell, a way of providing a platform for both links for software and hardware and um, be able to basically make it a sustainable for the Reading area. But we want to extend it further than that, so Thingitude is basically available for everybody. It's not just limited for, for Reading. Because one of the difficulties with a global network is how do you balance the geographic and the task elements of it. We have to have a geographic nature because the gateways are geographically located. Uh, but the idea is that they sh there shouldn't be borders around them. So things like Solent, yeah, it's fine for funding and things. Um, then also we want to get on, talk to people like 
everybody here, try and get everybody involved, try and bring you here, and uh, then use the social channels like Slack and the forums. Uh, I also have a Twitter at uh, uh, TVTTNUG, which is uh, a Thames Valley extension of it, which is something we did for uh, 3D printers when 3D printing. Um, so next steps, deploying sensors. Uh, Andrew will be talking about Thing Innovations and the workshop tomorrow. Our Things is a brand that we've created at Reading Makerspace, and I'll just quickly zip through some of the work things we've done to actually get some sensor hardware to be available for people. So this one, the microchip module you see in there with a shield, the very early prototype shield that Andrew created. It inspired me to start uh, soldering bits and pieces. Um, he provided uh, code for uh, Arduino, and a small, the small version was, was a, a little one that you could plug onto any device that would do a serial communications. Just, uh, so then went on uh, using that small device together with a, a plain Arduino Uno. Then I used my 3D printing to create an enclosure. Uh, I, this one intrigued uh, Anne Diamond when I did an interview on Radio Berkshire. He thought it was a, a, a weird looking device, so we drew sufficient attention on, on her radio show. Then we went on, we obviously going through the normal process. Other members in the, uh, the hack space were inspired to look at it and went through this process of, of taking some of the raw Semtech chips that are available on modules from RS. Doing, we always used to do uh, prototyping on breadboards, but now you can use prototyping boards to create a device. Next stage, it went off to China and produced some boards. They came back, and there were some ideas that we didn't need all these uh, aerials and tantas sticking out. So you've got GPS at this end, you've got TTN at the other end, and uh, an ARM uh, Cortex uh, processor in the middle. That was then revised with a small display, and then, so this is the basic board, realized we didn't need the antennas, put some active antennas at the end and uh, t evaluating the difference between a piece of wire and an active antenna. And then we went on to make an enclosure for it, and I have the, uh, the device available for anyone wants to have a look at it. Oh, uh, just zip through. So then they said, well, that's all very well, but you need to do C programming in bits and pieces. Okay. Um, and we've now done a version for the micro bit, and want to get this out so that people can do it in education, and I'll just zip quickly through if I can. Uh, uh, so we know all about the micro bit, and this is the micro bit and the LoRa, or the, or t the Things Network, LoRa uh, WAN compatible uh, device, which I have to show for people as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> Okay, my name is Mark Hill from OpenTRV. Two years ago, Damon from OpenTRV gave a talk about what OpenTRV is. Um, so I'm going to rush through that part um, and then get on to the meat of the talk today, which is all about the Things Network. Um, so very quickly, we're about cutting carbon. And this is how I'd like my heating controller to be. As in, turn it on, in October and turn it off in May and not have to think about it in between. That's what you get right now. Okay? And yeah, it's tough. All these schedules and settings and numbers and all the rest of it, and to be honest, I just like it to work. So that's what we're setting out to do. And this is how we do it. We have TRVs, which are smart. They contain electronics. They detect whether or not you're in the room. And if they think you're not going to be in the room for a while, then they'll turn the heating down and then try and turn it up again when it thinks you're coming back. Okay, pretty simple concept. No one else out there is currently doing it. You can have a look on GitHub. All the hardware, the Gerbers, the schematics, the software, it's all there. Okay, it's all completely open. Now, the relevance of this to long distance radio, LP1, low power wide area networks, uh, LoRa, long range. Um, Sigfox is a similar technology. Um, 
I'm just throwing out the buzzwords just, just in case it um, like triggers in you. OK, yep, I've got that one. I know which one it is. Basically, what it is is a very low data rate Internet of Things um, and a radio to do that. And the radios are quite small. This little silver blob on the top is a typical one. This is a microchip module in there. And they're very low power, and you can potentially run things for years and years and get your data onto the internet. And the particularly intriguing part of what we're talking about today, the Things Network, is you don't need to pay somebody for that bandwidth. You don't need to pay a yearly fee. And you can use other peoples around the world as they set up on the Things Network as well. So in particular, what we're interested in doing is putting these low-power radios into TRVs, which are those like little blobs there in groups of four in people's houses, get the data communicated to an IoT gateway, which is basically a LoRa gateway, and then stick it into a data store. And that can be on the internet, but it doesn't have to be. Because you can set up your own IoT gateways for this as well. And that's crucial, because you can then share your IoT gateways with other people. And we're looking at doing that in social housing, by the way. Um, so that's the background for OpenTRV and why we're interested in LoRa, primarily. However, it comes with its own difficulties. Um, one being that I'm not a lawyer. However, Ofcom is interested in this kind of stuff. Um, and there have been some questions raised in the UK about whether or not this falls under the regulations of a public network for communications. And it's not clear if it is or not. And not being a lawyer and um, you know, not sticking my neck out on this one, I'm not going to say it is or it isn't. But I'm just saying there, is, uh, there are some issues around this. If it is a public network, we must have registration. OK, fine, that happens. We must have data retention, as in the um, security forces or uh, the police are allowed to ask for what data flowed across this network. Now, this is done by ISPs all the time. OK, and it's transparent to us, but it happens. Um, it's just, where does that requirement land for a network like this, which is layered on top of the internet? Is it the internet that requires this regulation, or does this network require it? And in terms of service, so if you are a business customer, it's quite clear, in your terms of service, you're allowed to set up a gateway and make it available to anyone. Any member of the public happens to walk by with a device that works, such as the one down at the Bridge Rectifier, Hebden Bridge Mill. Um, which isn't turned on at the moment, Mike says, by the way. Oh, it is now. Okay, good. Um, fine. If you've got business uh, um, terms of service on your internet collection, it works. If you've got residential, grey area, we don't know if it's going to be accepted or not. I had a look at mine. It's not, it's not conclusive. Okay, now, more Ofcom stuff. Secondly, if, in theory, if you are, and this is particularly perhaps relevant for makerspaces rather than individuals, um, if you are doing some R&D, and not trialling, by the way, there's a difference between research and development and trialling, if you are doing some research and development, the testing regulations in Ofcom say you need to have a licence because you're using a certain spectrum and your stuff is not CE compliant, therefore you must have a, an R&D licence. Now, the good news about this is they only cost 50 quid per location for 12 months. The bad news about it is it takes something like six weeks at best to get yourself one of these licences. As a makerspace, it's probably smart to go for one of these. As an individual, personally, I'm not going to bother. OK, because the chance of anyone coming after you about this is not going to be large. But anyway, those are the URLs to apply for a license and, and the guidance that Ofcom provide for it. It's very important that if you do go and apply for one of these, make sure you explain what you're doing in terms of the battery powered devices that you're going to take away at a distance. OK, because you want all of those covered within that license. So that no one says, oh, great, you've got that gateway covered you've set up, but you haven't got all these little devices covered. Third one, Mark Stanley, who's not here today, but he's uh, very active in TTM Reading, um, has been having a conversation or two with Ofcom. And uh, this is uh, their most recent email back to him. But the most exciting part is, yeah, we're looking at it. That's it. That's all Ofcom are giving us right now. And yet, we're suggesting to them that this is having a chilling effect on development. As in, we're not developing this stuff as fast as we can because 
there is fear and uncertainty and doubt about what you're allowed to do with all these radio devices and this new type of network which potentially could replace the telecoms network and the telecoms companies and actually give all of us access to an internet of things network where you do not have to pay and there is good, I'm not saying universal, good coverage not only in this country but around the world. Now that's quite threatening for a telecoms company and so there is some FUD being spread. Um, in London, I know this is a, a northern audience and there are TTN uh, networks up in Manchester and, and other places. Um, I'm down in London. They are some people with money, Digital Catapult. They have bought some gateways from a company called Everynet, which is a Russian-based company. And they will happily dish out a gateway and give it to you if you agree to host it for Everynet. Now, Everynet wants to make money out of this, right? It's a commercial arrangement but you could at least get your hands on the gateway for probably very, li uh, very little or no outlay. Um, there's also a meetup happening um, specifically for low power wide area networks in, um, it's happening in London. Um, <coughs> and then the things network themselves, the guys out in Amsterdam and the guys in um, Rotterdam will be getting their TTN gateways out to us. The latest update was November. Okay, so that's a 200 pound gateway 200 euro, 250 euro gateway, let's, let's do the right one, 250 euro gateway that you can then have your own node on the Things Network that is a gateway that will allow anyone to connect. So that's for the gateway, so the chips, okay? So basically the little things that roam around all over the place, the devices, um, there's two major licensees so far from Semtech of the core technology. Microchip and ST. ST are quite late to the game compared to microchip. Microchip are quite a bit further advanced on what they're doing. At the moment, they're not doing any work on the European version. They're working on the US version, the 915 megahertz one, which is useless here because we can't use it. Um, so it's in its current state, the same state it has been since the beginning of the year. Interestingly, however, with their Atmel acquisition, they now have access to ARM cores and they're sticking a Cortex-M0 core with the uh, receiver circuitry for a node for the things network into a single chip and then they're going to have a tool chain that lets you stick your code that runs on the arm into that connects it up with their code that they need to have that's been certified that you're not allowed to touch because it complies with transmission regulations and all the rest of it in terms of duty cycles and lets you just have one processor inside your device, which means the cost comes down. Okay, this is where we're trying to get to ultimately. It makes for cheaper devices. Okay, currently they're flogging their devices at between eight and ten pounds. Okay, we'll have to wait and see how much they're actually going to charge. But you know, preliminaries, maybe if we're lucky, something like eight dollars. Um, they're having a workshop on their toolchain, but it's horrendously expensive. Um, it's uh, it's their global microchip. Um, go and do lots of courses thing. Uh, STM, who I used to work for, by the way, once upon a time, um, have not released much details. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, but I haven't actually run into many details of what they're doing at the moment. They've just said they've licensed it. Um, and then the other thing that everybody needs to think about with this, and before you go and put all your eggs in this basket, is what's happening with MBIAT and LTEM, which are a whole basket of acronyms, but basically are the telecoms companies' versions of what's going to be a low-power wide area network. If we fall asleep, right, if we don't do anything about this, if around the world groups like us don't do anything about getting a crowdsourced IoT network out there, we'll be paying the telecoms companies to use theirs. So if we want to have a crowdsourced IoT network, we do have to do something now. And whether that's just host a gateway or whether that's more actively join in, with devices and te technology <coughs> and so forth. Now's the time. And lastly, shameless plug. Um, okay, OpenTRV, as I mentioned, we're interested in Laura for these things. We're going on Kickstarter with our product in uh, October, November time. If you want an open source way to control your radiators, please go and visit myradbot.com and sign up and we'll let you know when our Kickstarter campaign starts. Okay, and it's all open, and uh, you feel free to go on GitHub now and download it. Okay, that's me. <laughs>